Well, okay. Uh, back we go now to Richard C. Hoagland in the beautiful mountains of New Mexico. Richard? Yes, sir. Here they come. First time caller line, your turn with Richard Hoagland. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you? Uh, I'm in North Dakota. Okay. Devil's Lake, North Dakota. We're experiencing flooding here. Yes, sir. Uh, as a good part of the uh, country is right now. And uh, I was wondering if it could be uh, from the uh, warming of the earth from the inside. I know so much oil has been taken out. And oil is, is uh, a heat barrier. Is, is that possible that we're being warmed from the inside out? Not really. The, the main thing that's going on is on the surface in terms of weather. And what drives the weather cycle on the Earth is the evaporation and then condensation of the predominant component of the Earth's surface, which is water. I mean, they don't call this the water planet for nothing. And three-quarters of the surface is covered by oceans. And that water, when it gets into the atmosphere, you know, when it's evaporated, has to condense somewhere eventually. Mm -hmm. And what the... what. See, I, I, I'm calling this whole thing now hyperdimensional weather because it's, it's so capricious and funny weird things are happening. Like Dames predicted years ago, the jet stream would come down to the deck. Yep. Well, the, what you're doing is taking a current of air, which is flowing along at 150, 200 miles an hour, and then you're putting a kink in it. And so that 200 mile an hour jet stream of air suddenly touches the ground, which it never is supposed to. Well, it's those capricious things that the hyperdimensional model says have to happen because energy is building and energy has to go somewhere. If energy is building, it's going to evaporate more water. That water eventually has to condense somewhere. So the change of local weather and the change of large regional climate is in essence predicted by the changes in the fundamental drivers that, uh, 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 behind the whole system, which is more energy in the system. Now, could you use this as, as a map uh, predicting uh, all types of global changes? Could well, I... in the best of all possible worlds, yes. The problem is that even with conventional physics and good old thermodynamics, the computer models, I mean, just look at your local weather forecast. How accurate, how far out are they? These are in Infernally complex equations to to solve, but I, I like you believe that that everything goes in cycles. And that's and right. But we don't have enough data, good data, because our lifespan, the lifespan of science. I mean, Art said a few minutes ago that according to the British, this is the hottest summer on record. Well, we only had records going back what a hundred years, maybe yeah. two hundred yeah. years. We're talking about changes on the order of thousands of years if not 13,000 years for the half cycle that, that I'm, I, I've been gently referring to. Right. So we really have no hard data. Now, we have softer data. We have things like VARVs in lakes. We have flood uh, uh, strata levels of, like, the Nile. We have, you know, uh, uh, estuaries around, uh, let's say, the big lakes in, in the southern part of the Soviet Union. We have gross climatological features. We have isotopic measurements in ice cores, but let me, let me give you a caveat. If we're right, if this physics really is a physics, then all of the radioactive measurements and all of the climate data based on radioactive measurements like isotope changes is immediately suspect. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why. A few months ago, there was a demonstration on Good Morning America. This is referenced in the hyperdimensional paper. And on live television, uh, as part of a cold fusion experiment witnessed by Michael Gillian, the experimenters stuck an isotope of uranium, U-235, I believe, in the middle of the cold fusion device. U-235 has a half-life, meaning it takes uh, X number of years for half the radioactivity to go away. That half-life is four and a half billion years. They were able, to, with this machine, in time-lapse photography to demonstrate that in about an hour and a half, they got half the U-235 to go away. I saw that. <laughs> this is yeah, no, incredible. I saw it yeah, it this is. This is astonishing. This is impossible. This is hyperdimensional physics, which means that every single measurement of Earth climate going back 20 years, 50 years, 1,000 years, 10,000, 50,000, 200,000, 
based on radioactive measurements or isotopes, or even things like dating, like carbon-14 dating of archaeological stuff, has to be totally rethought because radioactivity is not a constant in this physics. And that could throw everything off. It sure could. Well, thank you very much, guys. Kohler, thank you. Uh, well observed, Richard. It certainly could... Um throw a kink into carbon <laughs> dating. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Well, let me, let that'll me, make a lot of people happy, by the way. Well, it, it simply means, Art, that we should be a little humble. You know, this science today is a process. It's a journey. It's not an end. We haven't arrived. And the sooner that we get off our pedestal and think that we know everything, the sooner we start saving people's lives, property, their future, their children's future, in other words, the sooner we start acting like adults instead of kids having tantrums saying... Well, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of humble, way. Richard, in science. There's more ego than humble. But there has to be humble, and that's why we come back to Francis Barwood. The way we redress this is through a political process. Remember, the science that is being funded today, by and large, is being funded by all of us with our taxes. If we demand a certain standard, then we'll get it, but we've got to demand it. And the only way to do that is through an intelligent political process with people of integrity. I agree. Um, Wildcard Line, you're on the air with Richard Hoagland. Hi. Well, good evening or good morning, wherever uh, you want to say it. Mostly morning. All righty. My name's Roy. I'm up here in Fallon right now. I'm a truck driver. Yes, sir. And uh, Richard. Yes, uh, sir. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, when I was up there, I, I used to run flatbed quite a lot up north. And I ran up over into the uh, Pasco, Kennewick area of Washington, and I ran in a compression chamber door that I'd picked up in California. I took this up to a laser technology station up there that was three miles square. That's three miles four different ways. And they said that they were set one up there, one up over in Europe, one over in Japan, and these were all... Uh, laser beams that was going to check the gravitational pull from the uh, planets and shifts in planets and stuff like that okay. and see if it uh, done anything on Earth. And if all of these matched at the same time, it showed gravitational pull. Are you aware of this? I'm aware of it in theory. I didn't know exactly where the stations were or well, what, where, where we are with that. Well, I thought they were blowing smoke up my you-know-what because I've seen some interesting stuff as a truck driver in 10 years. But, I mean, it, oh, I, I've got to tell you, Art, this was amazing. And the stuff they were telling me was far beyond my comprehension. Mm. But, and I, it was just something that I wasn't sure if it was true, or if they were blowing smoke up me or what, but I'll tell you what, this was amazing. And they had uh, these compression chambers, because I guess they have to fill them all with these different kinds of gases. And uh, they were saying that uh, these gases is what shows if it goes off the line so much of a thousand millimeter seconds or whatever. Like I says, I don't know the dynamics of it. But these uh, chambers themselves were a heck taller than a two-story house and probably as wide as two semis wrapped around each other. I mean, <laughs> these were huge. And uh, they were all built. They had a concrete tunnels built above ground all the way around and every mile they had themselves what they call a pilot station and uh on the very corners they had these huge buildings set up <laughs> on each corner which had prisms in them i presume uh, i i never got to go into these uh main corners i delivered a compression chamber to one of the uh mile uh center buildings i wonder what that could I be call them. okay well, it but, sounds like it sounds like an interferometer or a version of a ring gyro laser, where you send the beam around both directions and right. measure the clock time, so right. you, you know, and then you measure the phase shift. And yes, depending upon various atomic constants not being constant, you will get changes in the laser output at the end of the experiment. In other words, what we have are, is an in-crowd and an out-crowd. We have most physicists and most people thinking we have a certain science. Then we have other guys that somehow are part of the black world that know a lot more than the, than the honest guys do, and there's no communication between the two, except randomly and occasionally when an honest guy will stumble across something. Sure. 
and then he is either, you know, he made an offer he can't refuse to come in from the cold, or he's turned into an idiot and made to seem like a, a laughing stock because he knows things he shouldn't know and he's not part of the in crowd. That's why we go back to Francis. Unless we have representative government that can bring these two worlds together, we're not going to be very happy on this planet very much longer. 